Do you want to use that or no? Okay. okay. All right. Hey, guys. So uh, so my name's Danny. and I'm Olivia. And so just a quick intro. So this is the first ever Tide Talk here. So this is very exciting. And so just kind of a quick background before we introduce our great speaker today. Uh, we kind of created this because we were having so much fun in our marine science classes, and we were kind of telling our friends about how cool it was. And they unfortunately, like, couldn't really kind of get the class, or it just didn't work out for them, and they didn't have the time for it. And so we set this up for, especially for non-marine science majors, just to kind of see of how much cool research is being done here at Duke with our awesome professors. And so we know you guys are super busy, and so we appreciate you guys coming here. Uh, additionally, there's also a YouTube link, so this will be uploaded onto YouTube, and will be a nice live stream. It'll be on our channel. Uh, feel free to kind of share this with other people outside of Duke and, and spread the word as much as possible. But uh, just thank you so much for coming here. It'll also be once a month, so this will be a recurring theme. And so this will be the, la um, the first one. And so hopefully it'll be in the, in the far future. So thank you for coming. Yeah. Also really briefly too, huge thanks to Erin Voigt. So this would not get off the ground at all if it wasn't for her. She's been working tirelessly getting the food for you guys and working this all together. So uh, Olivia and I started this, but we will not be here at all without Erin. So just quick round of applause for her. And uh, after with that. All right, so um, our speaker today is the lovely Dr. Dr. Sonka Johnson. Um, I had the pleasure of being at the Marine Lab last semester where Dr. Johnson was doing a sabbatical and um, his research is oh so fascinating. So a short little bio about him. Originally trained in mathematics and art, Sonka Johnson has studied marine biology for the last 32 years, the last 21 of which have been at Duke University He's particularly interested in vision, bioluminescence, and camouflage in the deep sea, but has also worked on animal navigation, vision at night, and human cataracts. cataracts. Um, his fieldwork involves multi-week research cruises that use scuba and a deep sea manned and robotic submersibles. In addition to exploring all of the visual tracks that animal performs, Professor Johnson is interested in improving communications between theoretical and experimental scientists, biologists, and physicists, as well as artists and scientists. Outreach is a strong focus and the Johnson research has been featured in many traditional media outlets, but it's also found in Finding Nemo, the Magic Treehouse book series, and the poetry, poetry of John Updike, the humor of Dave Barry, and most recently in Ed Young's An Immense World. Professor Johnson has also written two books, The Optic of Life and Visual Ecology, and is currently completing a third book on ocean life for a public audience. And in his spare time, he is an avid nature photographer and entrepreneur farmer. All right. Hey, going to the deep sea, might as well turn out the lights. Thanks all for being here. In middle of the Duke game, it kind of blows my mind. I thought there'd just be three of you here. Um, thanks for the great introduction. I'm really glad to be here. Um, so as you can see, today I'm going to be talking about bioluminescence, ultra black camouflage, deep sea fish, but probably a better way of describing the title of this is the convoluted path of scientific discovery. So this is not only a talk about deep sea and some of the things that go on in the deep sea, it's about how learning anything in science takes you on paths that you never thought you would take. Um, it took me to all these different people um, who are connected in all you know, different various ways with different interests. And it brought together things like the deep sea, weird technological material, solar cells, um, anti-radar reflecting devices like they have on stealth aircraft, um, and actually also the phases of the moon. Um, so my work, as um, Olivia said, you know, I came out of an art background. It was originally art and math. I never, ever thought I would be a biologist. It just very randomly happened to me on a half hour drive back from a very bad work experience. And we went through the alphabet and B seemed to be low in the alphabet and ended up as a biologist. But it turned out to be sort of the perfect career for me because the animals are more beautiful than anything I ever imagined um, when I was, you know, taking my art classes. And I could think about them in terms of math and physics and eventually biology to maybe understand a bit about why they are the way they are. And so I work on things like transparency, bioluminescence, um, giant squid and giant squid eyes, other different kinds of eyes, mirrors, um, 
different cut sorts of coloration and so on. And we use pretty much every technique we can think of. You know, we do molecular biophysics, we do a bunch of math, we go down in um, submarines, go down in um, scuba diving, build a lot of weird contraptions and so on, whatever we can really figure out that, you know, gets us to the answer, you know, we're trying to get to. So we've worked on probably 50 different major attacks of everything from whales down to little starfish. Um, and it's just been a really fun life, I gotta say. So this particular talk actually grew out of an artistic failure. So one of the things we do when we go to see when we're doing the sciences, we take a lot of photographs and we're not just taking them to document things and so on. We're also taking them artistically. And we give these photos to things like the Pew Charitable Trust, the different ocean conservation organizations. They go to various exhibits around the world and so on to basically highlight, you know, these are the animals in the ocean because most people never get to see them. If they don't see them, they don't fall in love with them. And if they're not going to fall in love with them, they're not going to conserve them. And so we try really hard, you know, to get people excited and to do so with really pretty pictures. Like what you're seeing here is a picture I took a while ago of a shrimp basically bathed in the bioluminescence that it vomited from its mouth. So this animal has two glands on each side of this mountain, just vomits out bioluminescence when the two chemicals mix in the water. But in the case of these um, ultra black fish, we just couldn't get a good picture. Me and Karen Osborne, who was in the previous slide, we would try again and again and again, and all we'd get was just these sort of like messy black blobs. And the only reason you really see any definition on this animal at all is because you can see the teeth and you can see a little bit of the shininess because it's out of water and you know there's glint and reflection from the wetness of the surface. If you put this in water, it would look even darker than it does now. And basically they all just always look like Photoshop mistakes. We couldn't get anywhere with it. And so we decided to turn our artistic failure into like hopefully a scientific triumph and try to figure out like what was going on here. Um, and most things in the open ocean, when we think about color, bioluminescence, uh, mirroring, transparency, all that, they all pretty much pull back to um, protection from predation. Um, predation in the open ocean is intense like nothing else you've ever seen. Um, for one thing, predation is three-dimensional, meaning you can be attacked from the ground, from above, from the side. At this moment, none of you are worried about like a buffalo or a tiger coming up from the ground underneath your chair and munching you up. Um, but you do have to if you're out in the open ocean. Um, the other thing is that there's really nowhere to go. Again, if a tiger were to come into this room, you know, I'd duck behind the podium, you'd duck under your chairs, you know, we could run through doors, get behind things and so on. But imagine instead if a tiger shows up in an open field and all of you have your legs like a little bit tied together, so all you can do is shuffle like being some poor little fish, you know, there's just not much that's gonna be good for you to happen. And so the final thing about it is, and I like to say it's the only place where you can be eaten by birds and sharks at the same time, is that predation can be really extreme. So when you've all seen those old nature shows where they have like a few lions on a little knoll in Serengeti looking down at like, you know, I don't know, like a herd of wildebeest, something like that. And then they come down and eat one or two, like the sick and the old and infirm and all that, like they always show in the nature shows and you feel bad and all that. Um, they never come down and eat the entire herd. But in open ocean predation, they can. So in open ocean predation, you can have like an enormous school of let's say 10,000 little poor little bait fish, predatory fish or whatever else will show up and they will eat that ball down to nothing. Um, there's a beautiful sequence of this on Blue Planet, the original Blue Planet series, sort of showing what it's like. So camouflage is a big deal. Um, but in understanding camouflage, the other thing you have to know is that as you go deeper in the water, the solar light, you know, the ambient light that is around us that basically informs all sorts of different camouflage tricks like being transparent or mirrored or so on that I've talked about in other talks, changes to a world that's pretty much entirely bioluminescence. Once you get to about 500 meters down, there's not enough light for you to really worry about it from a camouflage perspective, but then everybody switches around and starts making their own light and using it for predation. And the two that we're gonna think about today are one, a lot of different predatory fish use flashlights. They have usually a blue photophore, either directly above or directly under their eyes. Some of these have lenses and filters and little ways of aiming them around and all that sort of thing. And they just sort of poke their way through the water looking for anything that reflects any amount of light back. And if it reflects any amount of light back, it's gonna be investigated. And because the water itself reflects nothing, the water in the deep sea is incredibly clear. That means if you don't want to be picked up by one of these lights, you need to reflect nothing as well. 
it's not even good enough to be transparent. If you've ever like shown a flashlight at a glass at night, you know some of that light comes back. And so the animals that are transparent have to do something to swallow up every single particle of light, every single photon. Other animals that really have to worry about not reflecting much light at all, paradoxically, are some of the predators. So the anglerfish, like this one here, this is Melanocetus johnsoni, and it has a cute little, that cute little knob above its teeth there with a little bulb at the end. That's actually a little bioluminescent lure that it hangs out, and, you know, things come in and try to bite at it, and then, you know, the rather larger mouth with all the teeth will, you know, then go for that. This lure system doesn't work if the animal itself is lit up by the bioluminescent lure. I mean, for those of you who have seen Finding Nemo, the scene in the deep sea where, you know, the funny luring fish is like all that you see, like the giant mouth and all that, like coming out of the shadows. And this is not good for the anglerfish. So the anglerfish also as a predator needs to reflect as little light as possible. And so animals out there are trying to hide from the predators and the predators are trying to hide from their prey. And sometimes the only way to do it is to swallow up every little bit of light that hits you um, to a tremendous extent. So we got interested in these, you know, what we called ultra black fish. These fish are so black, we just couldn't, you know, figure out what to do with them. And so the first thing, you know, like every scientist, what are you going to do first? You're going to measure it. And so they said, we're going to measure how much light comes back. And this is just called reflectance. And we measured it. And if you look, you know, on this graph here, this is what we got over and over and over. This is Katie Thomas, one of my grad students who went out at the time on multiple cruises, mostly out of Monterey Bay. Um, and every time she got the same thing, which is that it's zero. And that's just kind of useless. It says like reflects absolutely no light back. It's zero. It's just buried in the noise. And it didn't matter if we were actually pointing it at the fish or not pointing it at anything at all. We could take the thing and point it down to a black trash can. And, you know, the same amount of light, it was just always zero. Was, we couldn't get a real measurement. And really frustrated us for a long time on all these different cruises until finally we came upon the idea that we needed, we couldn't just compare how black this was to anything normal. We needed to compare it to something that was one of the darkest things that was already out there and then go down from there. It's sort of like creating a new calibration where you don't just start out, you know, where something reflects a lot of light, but where it starts out reflecting almost nothing. And then you see how much better is it than that? So we use these sort of funny standards here, which are some of the blackest things that you can buy and started from there. And then we get this. Um, and you don't need to know too much about this. What you're looking at here is the reflectance of one of these animals. It's like what fraction of light comes back after it's being hit with a beam of light um, against you know, the wavelength of the light. And the thing you need to know is that most of the light in the ocean is at about 500 nanometers, which means it's blue-green light. Like most of the ocean is bluish green. And the bioluminescence is bluish green at 500 nanometers. And so the two things to sort of take from this are one, that the reflectance is insanely low. So the reflectance is 0.05%. It's kind of hard to put that in perspective. That's 100 times darker than just about anything you've ever seen in your life. So, you know, black pieces of paper or anything like that, they reflect actually about 2 to 5% of the light. And these things are 100 times darker than that. Uh, maybe some of the darkest things you've ever seen, like believe it or not, new tires are really, really dark. It's maybe still 50 times darker than that. So, and these are actually the darkest measured natural things in the world. And they're exactly as dark as the sort of the darkest made things that are artificially made. Um, so they're really freaky. The other thing to get from it is that even though across this entire spectrum, the reflectance is insanely low, like lower than anything you know, you're ever going to see in your life. Natural selection is still optimizing this so that its reflectance is the least right where it matters the most. Right at 500 nanometers where the bioluminescence is the brightest and where there's the most light in the ocean. And so you can see that even as good as they're doing, they're trying to do better, better, better. And it gives you an idea of just you know, how powerful the force of natural selection can be. So we measure this on a lot of different fish. You're looking here at a tree of a bunch of different fish orders. We had our two control sort of normally black fish that reflected about half a percent of light, which is still very, very dark. And then a bunch of different ones. This is another way of sort of getting at how dark these were. So the black fish are in this range here sort of from about, you know, the half a percent, which is the ones that are actually, we wouldn't even consider that ultra black, all the way down to 0.05. And you're looking at like a whole bunch of different sort of objects from your normal life. And the only thing that these things are remotely comparable are a substance called Vanta black that I'm gonna show you in a moment, and something called super black paint, which is related to Vanta black. If you ever looked at the Sochi Olympics, they made an entire pavilion painted in super black paint and then put artificial stars in it. 
So it just looked like there was a giant dark opening in the world with stars in it. If you ever, you know, just look it up on, I don't know, YouTube or Google or whatever. It's a they're gorgeous thing. Um, they've actually, I think they made a Lexus and painted it that way. And then they had to stop because you couldn't see it on the highway. Um, so to give you an idea about Vantablack Black and how dark it is, so on the left here is a bust of, I think it's some French philosopher or something. I'm not really sure. Maybe it's Moliere. I don't know who it is, but this is the same bust coated with Vanta Black. So you can see that not only, you know, is it very dark, but every single piece of modeling is gone. Everything you know, of normal light hitting the structure and making it three-dimensional is gone. And this is why we can't photograph the fish, because it sucks up so much of the light that there's just nothing left to give you any sense of what's really there. Um, here you're actually looking at a salad bowl. Um, a big salad bowl with a concave side facing towards you. And so what you should be seeing is this giant scooped out thing right here with the light hitting in a certain way and all that. But instead you just see like a circle. So it's pretty remarkable stuff and these fish are as good as that. So how do they do it is the trick. I mean, once we figured out how dark they were, we wanted to think, well, how are they actually doing it? And what we knew is that they couldn't just do it by adding more and more and more and more pigment. That doesn't actually work. So like this table up here um, is packed with pigment to make it really, really dark, but you can see that the surface is actually reflecting a lot of light. And any normal thing, you just can only make it so dark by adding more and more pigment. Which brings me to Velvet Elvis, which is no longer a thing, but it used to be a thing. In our old lab, we had Velvet Meatloaf. Um, and it's just to remind me to talk to you about Velvet the reason velvet was used in these like weird velvet Elvis paintings and by velvet is on the inside of cameras and the inside of all kinds of like optical equipment and things like that is that velvet is really, really dark because not only does it have a lot of black pigment and all the hairs, but because of the hairs, the light gets in and just bounces around between all the hairs. And every time it touches a hair, it loses a little more light because it gets absorbed. And so for something to be really, really dark, not only does it have to absorb a lot of light, but it has to do it in a structure that scatters lots of light. Basically the light has to get like lost inside a forest and just sort of bounce around between all these different things. And then eventually it'll get totally sucked up. And all Vanta Black is, is really, really expensive velvet. Um, instead of like little cotton hairs, it's millions and millions of carbon nanotubes. Vanta stands for vertically aligned nanotubular array. Um, it's a whole bunch of little carbon nanotubes. And so when the light gets in there, it just bounces around in between and then nothing comes back out. So the problem was that the fish were really hard to get um, and we didn't want to mess with them too much because, you know, once we started looking at them, you know, we might damage them. We'd never be able to figure out what to do and so on. So we wanted something easier and we figured, well, maybe we'll use an insect. And the really great thing about a department like this is all you have to do is go around the corner in any hallway and you'll find somebody who's like a world expert on something that you've never thought about. And so we went around to Fred and I out here um, who was like, literally right around the corner on the way to the bathroom and said, you know, do you have any ultra black butterflies? You know, and he didn't even blink. He didn't even say like, is that a thing or what are you talking about? He just reached around and he pulled up in a drawer behind his desk and it had like a collection of ultra black butterflies. He said, there happened to be some, I always thought they were really cool. He had written a book on um, butterfly coloration. So it was kind of his thing. And that was great. And then Alex, who was standing behind me at the time, he's like, I want to work on that. I want to work on that. And so he was a very eager kind of person. And so then he sort of agreed to sort of look at what was the structure of these ultra black butterflies so we could practice for figuring out what was going on with the fish. So this is one of the butterflies. It's Brooks Birdwing, a really, really beautiful butterfly. And this will only make sense to those of you who've ever done scanning electron microscopy, but this is a little piece of that wing. You can see a little bit of a green and then, you know, the black part and it just looks like, you know, like a nasty little picture. But what you don't know is that this thing's already been sprayed with a layer of gold, which is the first thing you do when you do scanning electron microscopy. And so this thing should look basically like a silvery gold, shiny thing on top. But it doesn't because the structure of this butterfly wing, all the weird little things that make it ultra black is still there even when it's coated with the gold. But so you don't even need the pigment at all for it to be as dark as it looks. It's actually doing it entirely with structure. It's the same reason this still looks green because this green is entirely made from the way light interacts with the structure of the butterfly wing, nothing about the actual color that's in it. Um, and then we did it and we found this cool honeycomb structure that believe it or not, all of you have seen. You've seen it every time you've looked into your microwave. 
So when you look in your microwave, the reason that the microwave, if it's on, isn't slowly cooking your eyeballs is because there's that screen between you and the um, looking inside, and there's a whole bunch of little holes. And each one of those holes is exactly the diameter of the wavelength of the microwave radiation inside your microwave. And because it's that size, the light has a really hard time squeezing through it. And it's the same thing here. These little holes were exactly the size of a wavelength of light. And when you set that up, it's, it's hard to describe totally, but it's a lot like trying to feel like when you were a kid, you slosh water in a bathtub at just the right speed, so all the water shot out. You have to do it at the right speed for the size of the bathtub. That's pretty much what the light is doing when it hits one of these holes. It sloshes in just the right way that basically uses up all the energy and then it can't get through. And it's just like your microwave. So we're really excited about this because this is exactly also how anti-radar reflective materials work on things like stealth aircraft in addition to the microwaves. And we were like, oh, we're going to publish this in some big journal. Everybody's going to be excited. We're going to be on the front of the New York Times. It's going to be really great. And then something happened that's never happened to me before, um, because we always work on really weird stuff in the lab, is I got scooped. Um, and I not only got scooped once, I got scooped twice. Um, the year before, the year before we figured all this out, somebody had already like figured this out for almost the same butterfly, same thing, honeycomb array and all that kind of stuff. So this is an actual data graph. It's not just me making a picture. Um, this is how my life has gone um, pretty much over the last 32 years. Every now and then I get lucky and something works. And then these are actually the real size. I went through every project I'd ever worked on and then worked out the sizes of all the different things of what had happened. And yeah, this is about right for misplaced faith at collaborator and a lot of wrong. And, you know, I think, you know, animals die, as my dad says, as a physicist, electrons never die, but my animals do and so on. So, you know, a lot of unlucky things happen. And if you ever go into science, this is your future or, you know, every now and then it's going to work. And the rest of the time, a lot of really stupid things are going to happen. It's just life. But I've never been scooped. I got scooped by these two papers by solar cell engineers. Um, and they had worked on butterflies pretty similar. And we were bummed by that. But then Fred and I got together and we're like, well, we're biologists. You know, what can we do? We decided to like, you know, sort of paraphrase that Martian movie. We're going to like biology it to death. And so we looked at all the different species of butterflies that were um, really ultra black. And we decided we were going to show that they all use the same honeycomb thing. It was this really cool form of convergent evolution and, you know, neat, 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 you know, do biology. And then we could still publish. And instead what we found out was something totally different that they didn't all use a honeycomb at all. Only this one tiny group that by dumb luck we had first worked on and the solar cell people did, they had the honeycomb, but everybody else did different things. And that led us to a project. I'm not going to go into any detail here at all. We called it the Mr. Potato Head project where we looked at the individual scales and the structures of these butterfly wings and they took apart all these different aspects of it and ran a million weird little mathematical models to see what mattered, people want. I can tell you afterwards, like what made it work, but I wanted to get back to these fish, which was like the whole point of this thing in the first place, was that you know we were trying to figure out these fish. Um, these are two species of eustomias and it gives you an idea of how hard it is to photograph them. So when we looked at the fish, we found out that they were basically walking melanomas. So a normal you know, animal that's really dark or fish that's really dark, they have what are called melanosomes. They're these little things that look kind of like Tic Tacs and they're embedded in your cells and there's a few here and there and a few here and there. And they're sort of nicely organized. But if you have a melanoma, the melanosomes can really go crazy and create an extremely dark area that busts out extracellularly and can eventually you know, bleed to your death as a metastasized skin cancer. Um, and that's what we saw here. And we're actually looking at it now molecularly with a group in Florida to see if, you know, that's actually the molecular switch that flips, that it's the same thing that actually triggers melanoma in humans is what triggers these ultra black fish to have this massive proliferation of all these little tic tacs. But while we're getting to that, we decided there's something about the size of these little melanosomes, these things that, you know, absorb the light, something about their shape and something about the way they're all piled together, kind of like a gumball machine. And there must be something about all those three things together piled up that is optimized to make these animals reflect as little light as possible. So this gets back to the beach. I can tell this really runs round and round. So all of you, especially since you're interested in the marine lab, things like that, you know, you've probably walked on a beach at some point in your life. And when you're walking near the water and you put your foot down, sometimes the sand will get lighter around your foot. And so why does that happen? Yeah, you're pushing the water away. But that leads to the next question. 
why are wet things darker than dry things? So like many different kinds of cloth, when you make them wet, they're darker. And a lot of other things are darker or shinier. So and some things don't change, some do. And there was a guy who was really good at these, thinking of these really basic questions, like why are wet things dark? And then like telling you like all the physics and math, when it was a guy named Craig Bourne, and he literally lives on top of a mountain in Pennsylvania at the end of a very long road. And it's a strange and interesting guy, but he explained this, um, I don't know, about 15, 20 years ago, that if the sand is wet, and here you have your little sand particles, I know they're kind of ugly, and then you have the light coming in, the sand in an optical way isn't that different from the water. There's something called refractive index, which is like how fast light moves through a material. And when the refractive index isn't so different as it is when you talk about sand versus water, whenever light hits anything in the sand, it doesn't bounce that far in any crazy direction. It kind of keeps going forward. And because of that, because it's going forward, it takes a long time to turn all the way around to come back out, which means as many, many chances after it hits so many different little pieces of sand and little particles and so on, to have each time a little bit more light absorbed in the dark sand, the wet sand is dark. If the sand is dry, what's in between the sand is air. And when that happens, there's a bigger difference between the sand and what's around it. The light scattered in bigger directions. And because of that, it has sort of a shorter trip through, is absorbed less, and sand is lighter. So what we needed in these fish was something that allowed, because the problem with the fish is right underneath their skin, and their skin's very thin, is a super white, um, what's called a basement membrane. It's a whole bunch of connective tissues, incredibly white. And so if the light comes in really, really fast, doesn't scatter, it bounces off the back and then it creates a whole lot of light. If it's scattered really, really hard, it might just pop out the top and again, there'll be a lot of light. We needed a situation with all these little tic-tac things for the light to come in and get stuck and basically bounce around and bounce around and bounce around and just keep bouncing until all the light was gone. And we wanted to know like what size and shape of these little guys, once they're all piled together like that, will give you that effect. Um, but the problem is, is that melanin, which these melanosomes have as their pigment, it's the same thing that can make our skin darker, is a really magical substance. And don't worry about too much about this exact graph, but what it's telling you is the imaginary index is how much light it absorbs. And these, you know, melanin is known for absorbing light. But the weird thing about it is it's really, really good at scattering light. It's about halfway to a diamond, and that's why dark hair is actually really shiny. And if you dye your hair black, it's not that shiny because melanin literally is about halfway between glass and diamond. And so it's, it's actually like better than cut crystal. And when you look at dark hair really close up, you just see all these beautiful shiny lines as all of it bounces off. And so melanin turns out to be one of the, like, the coolest biological substances out there. Um, and, but because of that, it makes it a real bear to figure out what to do. And in the optical you know, modeling world, which I pray none of you ever have to fall into, there's sort of the angel world and the devil world, as I like to call it. In the angel world, the particles you're dealing with are really, really small. They're very loosely packed. They have this low refractive index and they don't absorb light at all. A good example of this is just like tiny little particles floating in the ocean all away from each other. It makes it easy to figure out what's going on. The devil world, the particles are large, they're densely packed. They scatter light really, really well and they absorb light really, really well. And then when you're in that situation, it basically brought everything to a standstill and we just sort of spun our wheels trying a lot of different things. We had a funny side trip to the moon. Um, you know, the moon has phases, um, but the moon soil is, it turns out really weird stuff. So like a full moon is twice as big as a half moon, right? So, you know, this full moon twice as big as this half moon. So how much brighter is it? What would you guess? Twice. You think twice, right? It's actually 10 times as bright. And the thing is, we never actually get to see a really full moon because to see a really full moon, it turns into a lunar eclipse. And so the only people that have actually seen a full moon are astronauts on their way to the moon. Otherwise, you don't get to see it. So it turns out, if you look at how bright the moon is, as it goes from being a new moon all the way to a full moon, it just skyrockets. It turns out that the soil of the moon actually works like a retroreflector, like on a bicycle, that when the light hits it directly, it bounces back extra hard. And because NASA always had like so much more money than anybody else in the world. They just spent an incredible amount of money trying to figure out how you analyze this because it turns out that lunar soil is an awful lot like these little melanosomes. There's a whole bunch of these large particles that absorb and scatter a lot of light. And I won't bore you with it, but we went down a year long rabbit hole, like converting all this essentially Russian version of NASA mathematics to understanding these fish. And we got an answer that kind of worked. 
Um, but it was never as good as what we want. So in the end, which is something my dad always says, if all else fails, brute force prevails. When thinking about like trying to solve something in science, you just work at it where you just basically grind it out with a big computer. And so we use what's called a finite element model or a version of finite element model that looked at all different shapes of these little tic tacs. As well, one means it's a sphere, a four means a really stretched out tic tac. It's four times as long as it is wide. And then also how big each tic tac was and assuming they were all piled together the way they were piled together. And there's an area in the middle where you have a certain shape of these ones and a certain size where the whole pile together reflects the least light possible. And that's where, you know, these white circles are. And that's the actual data for some of the ultra black fish, the sizes and shapes of those things. So they really are optimized in size and shape. We thought, well, maybe that could just be an accident. You know, maybe they all look that size. So then we looked at a whole bunch of melanosomes that have been measured and all kinds of other things and fish and reptiles and amphibians, how big they were and how so on. It turns out they were quite a bit rounder and quite a bit smaller, about half the diameter. And all you're seeing over here is just little plots of how big and how sort of stretched out, you know, the different ones were. Um, the very last thing is like, sort of like, does, does the fish care, right? You know, does it matter that it's that much darker than it was? Um, and so we started out imagining that like, if the reflectance was like a sort of a normal construction paper, you know, sort of 2% black, and it was being viewed by a bioluminescent flashlight, you know, from a fish that could see it at a meter away, you know, how much closer would the fish have to get to be able to see it? And these are all the data from all the different fish. And you, so you can see that by the time you get to the really dark ones, um, they get really hard to see. I mean, it's basically you have to get like six times closer to see them, which means that your chance of like being found by some predator looking for you is just, you know, much, much, much harder. And with that, I just wanted to stop and take any questions. Like, like what, if they're so good at camouflage and they're so hard to be seen, what is their actual threat? Like, what is able to combat their, like, evolution? Well, basically, it's like an evolutionary arms race. And that's one of the things we study in the lab. I, I basically call it hide and seek in the open sea. You know, for every adaptation they come up with, you know, the animals on the other side come up with their own version. And so the visual systems on deep sea fish are extraordinary. Um, they're extremely sensitive. Um, they usually give up a lot of their ability to see detail. Like we're really good at seeing detail and take all of that and turn it all into like low light sensitivity. Be kind of like if your iPhone camera instead of having like a megapixel of information, had like one big pixel sitting in the middle. And you know, that one pixel is like a garbage can for sucking up light. So yeah, there are, basically they have counter measures. Some of them have extremely sensitive ability to detect fluctuations in the water via what's called a lateral line system and so on. Um, yeah, so it's a continual back and forth. Um, but these animals, many of them do live for like a hundred or a couple hundred years. So they are pretty good at dodging predators. A lot of deep sea fish can live for extremely long time. Yeah. Say again, you have to speak up a bit. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So yeah, there are some very big things, but you don't see them in these normal sampling methods. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Greg. Oh, okay. So in the daytime, you have to go down about 300 to 500 meters. At night, they're almost at the surface because all the, most of what's in the ocean comes up every night in a giant sort of feeding frenzy. So not so deep. In fact, some people scuba dive to it. Um, it's a little crazy. Um, so, you know, I had a guy we used to work with on the ships and he would go down 100 meters at night with some other people to basically float there and watch all the deep sea fish come up around him. Um, it's really dangerous and really stupid. Um, and he eventually gave up when he felt his heart like being crushed. Um, so he stopped doing it at that point. But um, people do like scuba dive in those depths. You have to be a nut, but yeah. The fish you're looking at were, were still like, Yeah, but you wouldn't physically be able to do it because a fish is a big, messy, wet thing. The thing about butterflies, skin, I mean, butterfly, you know, wings is they're, it's just all, it's chitin, it's all dead. And so they're the world's most perfect thing to put in an SEM and you can like coat them and all that. Yeah, the fish stuff is harder because it's all gummy. So in theory, yes, um, but in reality, you couldn't do that actual experiment. No, no, it, it's not even spelled the right way, no. no. Uh, and then the second question is, in my experience, Jumping into marine biology? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I got lucky in a number of ways. So like I mentioned, I literally applied to biology grad school without ever having taken a biology class. Um, I had taken like a small seminar on biomechanics in college that didn't really require any biology. And then I had a high school class where all he did was show pictures of his trips out west set to Pink Floyd. So we never actually learned in biology. So I literally stepped in with nothing but the advisor I got was this incredibly kind natured person who figured since I knew physics and math, he could teach me biology. And it took about two years to do that. And then when I applied for postdocs afterwards, um, the first person that got me started on all of it, all she wanted was somebody who could fix a, a particular computer program of hers. And one of the jobs I had before grad school was writing computer programs for, I used to program the original Macs. Um, and she needed that and she figured it would take my entire postdoc to do it, but it turned out to be a really simple problem and I fixed it before I showed up. And she made me a deal that if I fixed it, I could do whatever I wanted. And so um, I was here and so I showed up and I got to, that was how I got in. It was just totally by dumb luck. Um, because yeah, it is difficult um, to figure out like how to get into marine biology and how to get into grad school and continue on. And yeah, I did have some, some lucky breaks. Yeah. Uh, the mic's behind you, yeah. Oh, how do they? Yeah, they basically do a similar thing. So those, um, those really dark standards that we used to start with, it's a kind of a Teflon that's expanded in a weird made, way to make it kind of like styrofoam. And so if you look at it up close, it's a really weird spongy scattering structure but then they do it to a kind of a Teflon where they already add pigment. And so it's very similar in that the light gets in and then bounces around forever. It's not nearly as dark as this stuff. It reflects about 2% of the light, um, but that's dark enough for us to use it as a reference. Yeah. I have an online question from Catalina. Hey, Catalina. <laughs> the you showed of the fish Shows the least reflectance in the blue green. Yeah. Have you tried to photograph these fish? It's too low. Yeah. So even in the um, near, you know, so like over the range, like if you go from all the way from like violet all the way up to like near infrared, the reflectance is still like under about 0.2%, which is like really, really low. Um, 
I don't know, there's probably not a wavelength you could actually get a good picture of them at. Because once you move into the IR, everything's really, really dark. Everything, once you get into the IR, absorbs almost all the light because it's made of water. And everything down in the deep UV absorbs light because we have so full of DNA and protein. So yeah, there's no wavelength that works. solar cells they're starting to do that it's kind of cool because you know one of the things you know you can do as a scientist is be notified whenever somebody does something that cites what you've done and yeah everything from that we just keep getting cited in papers where they're building solar cell like contraptions yeah so and on that side i mean the thing is most solar cells are actually already really good at absorbing almost everything and going from absorbing like 99.5 percent of the light to 99.9 doesn't buy you that much but on the flip side, you've just, you know, cut the reflectance by a factor of five. And so for us, it's more interesting on that side. But they do, they care enough that they do it. Actually, one of the things in your regular life that absorbs light incredibly well is your phone. Um, because that's, you know, the early screens reflected so much light you couldn't use them outside. Now you don't even think about the fact that you can use your phone outside in the sun. But if you've ever noticed, if you leave your phone in the sun, it will get incredibly hot and then turn off. That's because this is, in your normal life, the thing that absorbs light the best. But yeah, they are starting to do that. Yeah, they're building all kinds of weird little, they're trying to figure out how you make it using technology. Yeah. I give you an idea. Um, for the different structures in each butterfly, because mm -hmm. you guys looked, it was not all the yeah. diagonal ones. Was there, were there structures that were, um, more successful or was it kind of like the margin it turned it seemed what really mattered was it's like you pretty much the things that really worked you had sort of a funnel at the top that usually did have a hole about the same as a wavelength and then there was like a catacomb underneath it's like you know it got funneled and whatever made it through the hole which wouldn't be much because it would bounce around being stuck in the hole of you know just the bathtub wave kind of size but that what got in there really was like in these old catacombs it's like a little pillared basement and the light would bounce around in there and have a hard time getting out. So that seemed to be, you know, the average structure that worked the best, but the ways of them doing that really varied quite a bit. Yeah, it turned out that the, the design rules for making something like that were way broader than we ever guessed. We figured they'd all have to look like the honeycomb pattern. Do we see this in terrestrial ecosystems, like outside of the butterflies and like <laughs> We see a little bit of it. So a really nice example, if you've ever seen the superb bird of paradise, it's the one where like when it's, when the male's really trying to show off, it all of a sudden does a weird thing where it wings, where it looks like a giant black oval with a blue smiley face on it. And it kind of goes back and forth like this. It's really cute. So those, the, the black area that the blue smiley face on is extremely black that was worked on by a postdoc of mine before she was my postdoc. Um, funny enough, some jumping spiders are extremely colorful and they have some of these ultra black parts on their body, except they're really, really small because jumping spiders are only many times a few millimeters across. So those are, there are a couple of examples. On land, the use is completely different than from the ocean. In the ocean, it's used for camouflage. On land, it's really used to set off other colors you know, that you can make the green look better, you can make the red look better if it's surrounded by an you know, extremely black surface. Also with this, like when you're getting scooped too, like, mm -hmm. do you think that had to do with word getting out that you were about working no. on it? Or was it just so, so happened they had to work? We were really unlucky. Yeah. Yeah, we were basically one year too old or young or whatever, yeah. Yeah. But it never happened before because usually nobody cares what we do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, the microphones here aren't always that reliable. From Catalina. Because of your work. I don't have a unique perspective, but we do have the unusual perspective of actually having been there. 
So, you know, there's only a handful of people that have been down at depth in a submersible. I mean, like really deep, like, you know, a thousand meters or so. I mean, I don't know, maybe a hundred or alive. Right? I mean, it's not many. Um, and so there's something about actually being in an environment and seeing it that really makes you, I mean, I don't know, it brings home that it's actually there. I mean, a phrase we used a lot when we did the giant squid stuff is that people only love what they see and they only care for what they love. You know, they only protect something if they love it and they have to know about it first. And so a huge part of what we do, because we know, you know, this kind of stuff we're doing, we're not curing cancer, right? You know, one of the big things we're trying to do is it's very like Horton Hears a Who. We're trying to like tell the world that, you know, there actually are like beings and, you know, regions that we never knew about. Loud. There's that scene at the end of Horton Hears a Who where they're all screaming, we're here, we're here. And we're basically trying to be like the mediators to tell the world that there's stuff there. Um, and we do see from the ocean floor, like what's there. I mean, like it's rare that you go on a deep sea dive where you don't see a toilet. Um, turns out toilets are remarkably visible at depth and there are an incredible number of toilets at the bottom of the ocean. They're not actually, I mean, of all the things you could put in the ocean, a toilet's probably the best thing because it's inert and it just kind of sits there. You know, it's like not nearly as damaging as all the microplastics and, all, and it eventually turns into a weird little reef. But, um, but yeah, we go down there, we see, you know, all the things. And then we imagine like some of like, you know, some of the carbon sequestration ideas of basically just killing everything at the bottom of the ocean with like compressed CO2 and things of that sort. So it makes it much more personal, right? Um, and we try to, via writing and art and photography and stories and all that, to get that personal feel of it out to people on land who will never experience it straight ahead, you know, straight up. Like the difference between the wavelengths of that fish block and the sort of not as absorbed. Uh, so there's a really cool and very small group of fish among the dragonfish that have red bioluminescence. And so the neat thing about the red bioluminescence is one, you know, all these dark things are actually easier to see, but an awful lot of the invertebrates in the water, like all the shrimp and all that, they can't make melanin. So instead they use what are called carotenoids that are very red and things that are very red in the blue are still extremely dark. But of course in the red, they're ridiculously bright. And so they can see all that and they have the added benefit that nobody else can see their flashlights because nobody else can see in those ranges. And so they pretty much have like their own sniper scope. Um, and the coolest thing about it is that the cones in their eyes that they use to see, you know, this very red light, it's actually almost into the infrared, are actually only sensitive to green light. But what they do is they actually eat some chlorophyll from phytoplankton that's come down from the surface and they pull out the chlorophyll molecule, take out the magnesium, they have something left called a porphyrin ring and they put that in their green cones, and that makes their green cones sensitive to infrared light. It actually would work for you too. They've done this like in rats and mice and stuff. If you do the same procedure, all of a sudden you'll see red light is like five times brighter than you ever saw it before. I mean, don't go home and do this, but, but yeah, you can. And so, yeah, there are a small group of fish that do exactly that. They such, essentially run around with like these little chlorophyll derived little red cyperscopes. And that's one of the sort of arms race things. Uh, with no other questions, thank you guys again for all being here. And um, stay tuned, we're going to be doing another one in about another Tide Talk in about a month or so. Woo! Alrighty. Fantastic. Oh,